All right, everyone, we're going to get started here. Uh, there's a few more people still signing on here. So uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, last week, we had a, a pretty epic world event. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to utilize our Appella, Appella Academy to uh, do an impromptu session to make sure everybody understands what's going on uh, in the global economy, but most specifically in the European Union. So for those of you who are new to Appella Academy, really what this was designed to do um, was to share ideas on different financial planning topics. It was a um, really a forum to educate and get people involved in um, all aspects of financial planning. So for, for us planners here at Appella capital, we want to make sure that um, people are understanding that we're not just the investment folks. You, you can come to us for far more than just uh, stock and bonds um, and mutual funds. We want to really share ideas, get you thinking, and hopefully start to put some of this into practice within your own financial plans. So look for more of these. Um, we generally do them every two months. Um, if you uh, are interested, you can go to our website, appellacapital.com. We have a bunch of recorded versions uh, of past uh, sessions that we've done, along with a lot of other video shorts on a variety of financial planning topics. So please check out our website and be um, be alert as, as we'll probably be sending out an invitation to another event in the next couple of weeks here. So Today's topic is uh, the UK's uh, decision to leave the European Union. And uh, to discuss this, we brought in a, a couple of people here to help me out today. First is Patrick Sweeney, uh, partner at Appella Capital and Symmetry Partners. And then Phil McDonald, Director of Fixed Income and Alternatives at Symmetry Partners. So thank you to both of you for joining me today. Um, so I think probably the best place to get started here is really just to take you through a bit of a, a history lesson. So I, uh, I was joking around earlier about having to write a, a two-page paper on what is the EU for, uh, for my eighth grade project here. So if it's a little dry, I, I apologize, but it's important to really get a, an understanding of really what the EU is so that you can understand Britain's issues and the process um, that will take place next. So the EU really was established after the Second World War. There was a, there was a movement to create unity uh, amongst Germany and France, which would that those decisions would ultimately lay the foundation for the European Union four decades later. So the EU can trace its origins back to the European coal and steel community and the European economic community formed in 1951 and 1958, respectively. Essentially, these were uh, agreements to keep Europe from ever going back into war against each other. And the, the efforts were um, headed by France and Germany. So the process began with, with these six nations, including Germany, France, Belgium, um, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands. And it's grown tremendously since then, from those six countries to 28 today, soon to be 27. Essentially, um, each nation, when they join, gives up some sovereignty to gain strength, size, and economies of scale. And if you're looking to really understand the, the scope, the magnitude of the EU, today there's over 500 million people inside of the EU. Uh, it could be argued, actually, that it's the largest economy in the world. Granted, it's made up of many countries. Um, and really, the idea of the EU is to have open borders, to allow people to pass, move freely, settle where they like, and to allow free trade amongst all these nations, to benefit all these nations. And really, it gets a little bit complex, as most governments do. Um, and just a quick overview on how the EU works. You really need to understand just a few governing bodies. First, there's the uh, European Com uh, Commission. And this is essentially the civil service unit of the EU. It's run by a group of 28 commissioners, one uh, from each member country, and decide, decides where the money gets spent and which new laws are going to be drawn up. It's based in Brussels. Next is uh, somewhat of a familiar term. This is the European Parliament, and this is also a, uh, based in Brussels. So members of this parliament, and there's 751 of them, vote on these new proposed laws by the European Commun uh, Commission. So elections are held every five years for these uh, MEPs or these members of parliament. And the amount of elected officials each country gets, this will sound familiar, is really based on the population of, of the country, uh, respectively, to the EU. The Council of the European Union, um, this is where represent, representatives from each member nation kind of get to come and have their say. Essentially, it's more bureaucracy and political, political bickering. 
So when you look at the council and parliament, together they develop and implement the EU's annual budget. And this is really where a lot of the... Uh, the, the bickering begins. So each country funds the EU by making a contribution of their gross national income to the EU. Now, Britain contributed 12.6% of that, the entire EU budget in uh, 2015. To contrast that, Germany was the largest con contributor at 21.36%. So those are really how a, a bill becomes a law um, and how the budgets are determined. But you also have to remember that on the finance side, we have the European Central Bank. And the European Central Bank or the ECB coordinates policymaking, supervises banks, and monetary policy. Sounds a lot like what our central bank does here. So to make it a little bit more confusing, um, you'll have to realize that not every member of the EU uses the same currency. And the UK is a great example of that. They use the pound sterling, while many operate under the, the euro. So if we actually take a look at the, the next slide, we can actually see the countries who are operating under the euro as their main form of currency, and then EU member states not using the euro. So this actually might be surprising to some. So the ECB is actually still relatively new, right? So I want to say it's still trying to find its way, but it's only really been around since 1998 when the euro was introduced. So essentially, you can see here that there's a lot of member nations. They have the ability to influence decisions, participate in the process, but there's a larger political organization at work here. So for many people in the UK, the control that they'd given up, the money they contribute, they feel like it hadn't benefited them enough and that maybe it was time for a change. So we'll talk about some other issues here that, uh, that might have influenced the, the decision. So I'm actually going to bring in um, our, our two guests today to start to answer some of these questions. So I guess, Pat, I'd like to start with you here um, and, and give us your opinion on some of the issues that face the EU and, and maybe why the UK really started to have the decision or the thought to, to leave the uh, EU. Well, thanks, Jason. Hello, everybody. Um, this is a, a very interesting issue. Uh, when you look at a country like the United States, there's over 300 million uh, residents of the United States. And, and we here like to think of the Northeast as being different from the South, as being different from the Midwest, as being different from the West. Uh, yet we're all one country. Well, consider Europe. You have countries in Europe, peoples in Europe, that have literally... Uh, uh, been antagonistic towards each other in some cases, at war with each other for hundreds of years. So while the economic idea underpinning the European Union uh, is a good idea, it, it creates a, a large economic block which would benefit members of that block, you still have a, a variety of cultures and ideas and approaches to things that uh, still clash with each other. Uh, we have on the screen immigration and border control. It's not just an issue here in America. It's an issue in Europe as well, um, uh, magnified by the Syrian refugee issue that they are all grappling with in, in Europe right now. So uh, no different from what we, what we have to deal with here and perhaps even more magnified uh, just in the past two years. Um, there was a, uh, not a referendum, but a poll uh, done uh, just before the Brexit occurred, the uh, UK referendum. And that poll was uh, taken in France, where more than 60% of the respondents of that poll said they would like to leave. It wasn't binding in any way, but it showed the same type of uh, sentiment amongst uh, the people uh, in France as we see in England. Uh, I, I think there's been uh, a lot of surprise, and we can we can talk about this from an investment standpoint. Um, uh, traditional active managers uh, they're supposed to anticipate these things. They're supposed to position people's investments based on their uh, view of the future. And uh, I think everybody who's listening to us right now has probably read what we've all read. This took everyone by surprise, this particular vote. Um, there was some type of silent majority, barely a majority, that felt uh, they didn't like having decisions made for them a thousand miles away in Brussels. Um, while I can sympathize with that, that feeling, I don't know if this is the right thing for Britain to do or the wrong thing for Britain to do, um, but we don't make decisions here on investments based on geopolitical events such as this. We certainly monitor them. Um, we're not saying we'd never make a change, uh, but we don't do it because we think it's going to be better or worse for England or Europe in the short run. So I think what we have to consider here as investors is um, how does it affect our portfolios? Well, increased volatility, 
Uh, markets don't like uncertainty, and we've seen that in the last couple of days. We'll continue to see that in the next couple of days. Um, but does it really affect the fundamentals of how we invest? Uh, we don't think so, and we'll speak uh, more to that as, uh, as we go on in the presentation. Thanks, Pat. Uh, you know, it actually struck me as funny as uh, when you were speaking. Um, I, I gave that intro on on kind of the, like I said, the eighth grade book report. What is the EU? And uh, there was a story the the morning following the vote in the UK. The top two Google searches after they voted to leave were uh, "What is the European Union?" and the second most popular search in the UK was uh, what does it mean to leave the European Union? So I don't know that they had a full grasp of the issues at hand uh, when they made the decision. Um, so hopefully the, the day after they well, understood what they did. Sh shocking, an uninformed electorate. We, we, uh, uh, what we've been hearing here, it makes sense to me. I, I don't know uh, uh, that there's any um, real data to support it, but what we're hearing here is a conventional wisdom is this may be difficult economically for England in the short to intermediate term and in the long run, who knows? Um, uh, all of these countries were around for hundreds and in some case thousands of years and they managed to negotiate with each other and have treaties. So uh, the nice thing about this is diversification is your friend. A country is not about to go out of business. If the next couple of years uh, prove uh, rocky for England's uh, economy, and we have we have no idea if that's the case or not, but if that proves to be the case, uh, we're very confident that they'll come out of this. Well, actually, yeah, here's kind of the breakdown by geographic region. So I forgot my first click of the day. Um, so, Phil, I guess I'm, I'll ask you. Um, why don't you take us through what's next? Because, you know. No state's ever actually done this before. So here's where uncertainty really starts to creep in. Yeah, for sure, Jason. And I, I would agree with that. So um, I don't think we're alone in, in putting forth this idea that the process for leaving the EU is going to be lengthy and uh, complex. Um, it, it's a fact that in the Treaty of Lisbon that, that governs um, all these states coming together in the EU, Article 50, you might have heard, re heard reference to that. It allows for states to choose to leave through, you know, their legal, regular parliamentary constitutional processes. Uh, but it stops short of saying how then that will be achieved. It's actually pretty short in text. I was just glancing at it this morning. Um, what does that mean? Well, uh, this advisory referendum in the UK where 52% voted to leave uh, the EU uh, now needs to be acted upon by their parliament. And the prime minister, who is admittedly a pro-EU politician, has said that he will step down. There will be a new prime minister voted in in the UK, which will likely take a handful of months. And from there, uh, the, the UK parliament needs to formally invoke the Article 50 uh, choice to exit the EU. From there, there needs to be a negotiated exit. So um, I've heard several estimates that this is likely to be at least two years, if not longer. Um, since 1972, every law passed in Britain has been uh, in compliance with EU legal standards. Uh, so, so there's really, really a lot to unwind here. Um, no state has ever done this. No state has ever left the EU. That said, there are, you know, uh, political parties in, in each one of these member states. Pat referred to a poll in France a couple weeks ago. There are political trends in each one of these states where a portion of the population is not in favor of staying in the EU. So um, it's, it's not, I think, that... Um, you know, rare that there's going to be feelings against staying in. That said, in addition, um, the UK was always, um, you know, kind of a, a careful participant in the EU. They, they kept their currency, the pound sterling. They always said they didn't want a common defense policy. They always said they didn't want a common foreign policy. So they, they dipped their toe in just enough to take part and benefit economically um, and really not cede much of their, their sovereignty. And culturally, they're arguably a little bit more similar to the United States and Canada and Australia um, than, than they are to continental Europeans. Um, so, so obviously uncertainty, big, big questions follow. Will, how will the EU negotiate with, with the UK? Are they going to negotiate in good faith? Or are they going to have um, kind of uh, feelings of vengeance and, and want to really stick it to the UK? 
who knows? It's probably not going to be good for anyone if if the negotiations follow really hard line kind of vengeful um, yeah, priorities. Um, the UK has approximately 50% of their exports going to EU. So the UK is not moving geographically. They're staying exactly where they are. They're going to continue to interact with the EU. Um, I think the, the biggest questions, the, the ones that will take the most time to, uh, to work through are going to uh, relate to trade and immigration. So several states that are not full members of the EU and don't use the euro um, do have agreements with the EU, thinking of you know, Norway and Switzerland in particular. In some cases, to get uh, certain economic advantages in, in the sense of trade and, and, and investment, um, these countries have had to accept a degree of free movement of people. So uh, we, we referred to the immigration issue being one of the major considerations here. Uh, this is likely to be a, a kind of ongoing political discussion, and um, you know, it's, it's uncertain exactly where that's going to end up, but we certainly need time to, uh, to see where it goes. We've gotten a question about the, um, the exact exposure in our portfolios to the UK. Uh, it's, it's reasonably, uh, I would say, muted. So here we have graphics of um, all of our structured allocations, the qualified structured models. The top graphic shows um, kind of uh, a zoomed in view. It's, it's really just showing um, zero to 10 percent. So uh, roughly 4% of the equity allocation in the structured models is, expo is in EU securities. And the fixed income varies based on uh, risk tolerance and, and model. Uh, so in total, the equity and fixed income uh, exposures to the UK and the structured models are, uh, are certainly less than 10%, in some cases much less than 10%. That bottom graphic I have here is showing the very same data I've just expanded the scale of the graph to show 100% of the portfolio, just to put it more in perspective in terms of really what we're talking about here. So, uh, you know, less than 10% of the portfolio in aggregate in, in UK equities and fixed income. And, and just a quick glance. Actually, before we click to the next one, I just wanted to mention for, for anybody who's actually new to Appella, the, the term structured is actually just the, the name of our portfolios. So when Phil references that, it's the normal mutual fund portfolio structure that we have there. Uh, and then, Phil, I'll click to the next one for you. Sure. Thank you. Second one. So <clears throat> relative to um, the global market cap, the share of global market cap that the UK equity and fixed income markets represent, um, roughly 16%. We're certainly below that across the board in all portfolios. This point of view, it's a similar uh, cut of the data just for the global core ETF portfolios, which are a little bit more um, globally market cap weighted on the equity side. So you'll see roughly 7% equity exposure to the UK, but very little fixed income. And again, in the grand scheme of things, looking at this on a 100% level, um, reasonably muted, less than 10%. Um, I, think, I think it goes without saying, uh, those of you who are familiar with our philosophy, we're not going to react to this by changing the portfolio. Um, it, it doesn't figure into our philosophy, tactically taking positions based on news. We actually encourage uh, every, all our clients to ignore the news, turn off CNBC. Um, you, can, you can maybe point to, you know, short-term trades that were logically consistent, like, well, this happened on Friday, on Monday, I shorted the pound and it went down and, you know, bully for me, I was right. But short-term trends like this can reverse very quickly. We're focused very much on uh, long-term strategic uh, risk and return aware portfolio allocations. So we won't be making uh, really any changes at this point. A little bit further discussing uh, impact on investors. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty to here. There's a lot of short-term volatility. Um, returns over the one and two days since the Thursday referendum, you saw um, global equity markets down uh, almost 7%, looking at the MSCI All Country World Index. S&P 500 index was down in the US, large cap index by over 5%. The pound sterling, the currency in the UK, over those two days was down over 10%. 
Um, but it's important to really look at the long term and not be reactive to these short term moves. There's a lot of emotion, uncertainty and volatility wrapped into into these few days of trading. Again, this is going to take years to work through the system. Uh, it's very likely that the, the negative aspect of this news is already priced into the market. So reacting at this point will likely not do any good. Um, and we're just going to need time to, to watch this. Pat alluded to it earlier. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about it in the upcoming slides. Diversification is critical. It's one of our primary driving concerns in portfolio construction. And events like this uh, really hammer home why it's important to, to not be concentrated or drastically overweight relative uh, to market cap weights. Um, and, and finally, you know, every decade you can point to multiple events where you know, news coverage, uh, the whole, if it bleeds, it leads approach to covering events locally and globally. There's always going to re be a reason to say you shouldn't be invested. But over the long term, it, it certainly pays to uh, ignore some of this noise and, and stay invested based on your objectives and constraints. Pat, I guess I want to throw that to you. Um, you know, you've, you've been doing this quite a while. I mean, symmetry in a in a Pella in some form or another has been around for over 22 years, but you've been in the industry longer than that. There is always a reason not to invest. And, you know, one of the things that, that you've seen um, probably more than some of us here is people coming to you and say, yeah, but this time it's different. And, you know, here's why I shouldn't invest now. Um, give us your thoughts on that. First of all, thank you for reminding me how old I am, Jason. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I was thinking about this this presentation, and I, I asked you to find a slide similar to what we have on the screen here now. Um, and Phil ended his comments with with the line that that I've used for many many years. So thirty three, going on thirty four years in this business, and and I've worked in commodities markets, bond markets, and stock markets. And I can't think of a period of twenty four months going by where we didn't have some major market event. However, you wish to define that. It was something that dominated the news for quite some time. If we just go back um, uh, to uh, the last 20 years, uh, as Phil said, there's always a reason not to invest. In the last 20 years, from the mid-90s, we saw the what we called the Asian contagion, where Asian markets collapsed, followed by the tech wreck, where the NASDAQ dropped 75% from peak to trough in 2000 through 2002, uh, followed by the Great Recession in 08, 09, um, uh, uh, of recently we've had, uh, Greece, um, their e e economy imploding, China's, uh, economy slowing down dramatically. And, and now we have, uh, the Brexit. So uh, there's really two lessons here. There's really two. Um, number one, there's always going to be something happening in the global economy. It could be geopolitical, it could be financial, it could be a combination of the two or just purely political. That will give people pause and cause markets to react uh, in a very volatile manner in the short term. And number two, and perhaps uh, more insidious, it's almost impossible to predict. I heard of no one discussing Britain actually voting to leave the EU until it happened. So we woke up uh, and saw it that morning. Uh, it caught everyone by surprise. So uh, I've always felt it foolish to try and invest based on predicting the future. And uh, this last event certainly bears that out. Um, now, when events like this occur, uh, the news likes to seek out people who made money on some type of bet, and they were correct. Uh, we saw that um, the movie The Big Short, based on Michael Lewis's wonderful book, um, where there were a handful of folks who made money on, on the market collapsing in 08, 09. Uh, I think Michael Lewis came up with five people for the movie. There's literally hundreds of thousands of investors out there every day trying to make guesses on what's going to happen. And, and, and Mr. Lewis came up with about five of them. Uh, it's a waste of our client's time. It's a waste of our time to try and invest their money based on what may or may not happen in the future. Uh, what does make sense is to... Uh, use data supplied to us by reliable, unbiased third-party sources, and then for us to go through that data and make reasonable, prudent decisions on how to invest. The first most important decision, we alluded to it earlier, is to be diversified. So all of these events on the screen, world wars, uh, uh, countries going bust, uh, looking at the periodic table, uh, shows us that we never know where the best place to be is at any given point in time. We do know there's always a wonderful market in the world and there's always a place doing poorly. 
and a truly diversified portfolio is going to land your return somewhere in the middle. We've gotten the question uh, periodically, the S&P 500, large companies in America, has done particularly well in the last several years. Uh, well, we didn't get that question from 2000 through 2009, where the S&P 500 actually lost money over the entire 10-year period. What we want to do is build diversified portfolios that own thousands of securities from dozens of countries around the world. And your returns are going to be somewhere less than the best performing market, but better than the worst performing market. If you're going to build a highly concentrated portfolio, you might find your, yourself doing really well in a given year and then doing very poorly. The periodic table of asset class returns demonstrates the volatility in markets and how in, in one particular year, a market can be at the top of the list and uh, 12 months later at the bottom of the list. And uh, for most of the people that, that uh, we manage money for, that's not acceptable, that type of volatility. And I think it's, you know, it's interesting. You, you you point out how hard it is to predict on a year-over-year basis. Um, what this next slide shows us is that it's almost impossible to do on a quarter-by-quarter -quarter basis, right? We would think that it's harder to predict the future a year out, two years out, three years out, but we think we would have a better chance of doing it two months, three months, four months out. What we can see here, just as a previous slide shows, is that um, even with even within um, it, you know, a, a given year, quarter by quarter, asset class returns are all over the place. So, you know, and, and Pat, I'll let you jump back in here. It's important not to be reactive to what happened yesterday or to try to predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, though that type of guesswork really leads to no advantage. It does. I, I think the key word there is prudent. So, you, so there are markets that are more volatile than others historically, but you want to have prudent exposure to them. So uh, in this particular slide, emerging markets value stocks, those are uh, low price distressed companies in some cases in emerging market countries. Um, uh, last quarter, uh, they were down uh, almost 2%. They've had a really rough go of it for the last several years. Over the last 20 years, they're probably still the best place to be in the world. And just this past quarter, up nearly 8% for the quarter. So do you put 50% of your money in something like that? No. You probably put 2 3 4% of your money in something like that. And that's what we've done. And you have most of your money, uh, the people on this particular call, have most of their assets in terms of stocks in large companies in the U.S. So they benefited from the S&P doing well. But we, we do, um, to uh, rehash briefly, we do overweight value stocks, low price distressed companies. We do overweight small company stocks, uh, stocks that exhibit upwards momentum in their price. We overweight those vis-a-vis -vis the market. And so um, these factors, in addition to asset classes, diversify portfolios. When, when one factor is doing well, another factor uh, may be doing poorly. They offset each other in the long run, but we look for them to have positive expected returns and contribute to the overall positive performance that our portfolios have exhibited since our founding. You know, and... You know, as I guess, actually, let me uh, let me point out that we're, we're going to take questions here. So there is a little chat box where you can type in your questions. So feel free to ask anything and we're happy to go back. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, the market and investing and, and how to how to kind of play this, which is a, an unfortunate term that you hear quite often on your CNBCs and Bloombergs of the world, right? How do you play this? Um, you know, what, what to do with your money? For those of us, for those of you who have worked with us for a long time, and for those of you who are, are relatively new to us, you know that it all starts with the foundation of the financial plan, right? We've, in, we've invested you in a way that suits your time horizon, your risk capacity, and your risk tolerance. So, the idea here of what should you do today, um, you know, for, for those of you and most of you on this on this call are long long term investors. But at the end of the day, you're all long term investors, meaning that you don't need this money for the next five, six, ten years. So we've taken appropriate steps here to make sure that you're in the right type of portfolio with the right stock exposure, the right balance. So there is there is nothing to do. Um, at a moment like this, because over the next 10, 20, 30 years of your lives, your investing lives, um, these events will continue to happen. And uh, as Pat kind of alluded to earlier, you will not be able to dodge all of these bullets, no matter what the pundits on, uh, on places like CNBC have to say. So um, 
I, I will um, I will hold it there for questions. So feel free to type away, and then uh, I'll let you guys make any other closing statements that you, you think. You- yeah, just to jump in really quickly uh, at the end here, Jason. I I I think your comment about the difficulty to predict even in the short term, as defined by quarterly. It's certainly true. I'll, I'll see that comment and raise you a little bit. Um, I'd even say daily. So back to you know the the referendum being clarified overnight, uh, U.S. time, Thursday to Friday. Uh, Friday, a lot of negative performance in in equity markets and currency markets. Monday, the same thing. Today, the opposite. I glanced at the screen earlier, about an hour ago. Uh, and, and a lot of these um, equity indices and even pound sterling was up. So anyone attempting to to trade on uh, a short-term trend, if you can call it that, over the last two, few days uh, w- would have been wrong. So just want to add that in there. It's it's incredibly difficult to uh, to predict in the short term. Um, so there is a, there's another question in here. Um, saying it only took a couple of days to experience a loss, um, whatever the amount of that loss. You mentioned it'll take years for this to unfold. Um, and the question here is, do you anticipate that it'll take years to rebound? Um, Phil, you want to take I, I would say not necessarily. So the, the comment about years to unfold is really a political one. And, and there's, there's a really complex chain of you know, events and interactions here. In the short term, politics are impacting markets. Um, as we as we work through this, and as the say the treaties are unwound, and that that takes you know call it two years, um, the the political atmosphere is going to impact the real economy. So the UK GDP and inflation and unemployment might have an impact from how exactly this this pans out. Then it's a question of of through this whole time frame how the capital markets respond, right? How they respond to the political impact, emotional impact, uncertainty in the short term, how they're going to work, they're going to respond to hopefully an orderly withdrawal and and decoupling. Um, So I'd say you you can't really take from um, a two-day dislocation because of a surprise event um, and and assume it's going to take a long time to recover. We, We really don't know. I think I saw the FTSE 100, a large cap UK equity index up more than 2% today. So, you know, hard to predict. Um, there's, a, another, there's another question in here, um, more specific to maybe one of our, our mutual fund partners, um, Dimensional Funds. Um, Pat, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, some of the, the kind of the trading techniques at the mutual fund levels. It, it actually isn't just unique uh, to Dimensional. Dimensional is, is probably... Um, probably one of the um, first firms uh, to trade in this manner. But uh, we've been to Vanguard's uh, trading floor. We've been to AQR's trading floor, two of the other providers to our mutual fund program. And and they are all trading in a similar fashion. So um, one of the things you can take comfort in is that the providers that we utilize practice what we call, uh, for the purposes of this conference call, patient trading. Uh, there, there are two aspects to this uh, approach to investing that give you comfort in times like this. Number one, the tremendously broad diversification and that they don't slavishly follow a published index in the case of DFA and AQR. They don't, they don't have to make a change when an index changed. So many of you have heard us talk about indexing as a good way to invest. We think it's an excellent way to invest. We are certainly cousins to indexing. We think we represent the evolution uh, of indexing. Uh, so the tremendous diversification and not having to follow a published benchmark like the Russell 1000 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S&P 500 allow for companies like DFA and AQR not have to not have to make changes when the indexes change. And sometimes when events like this occur, uh, a company falls into or out of an index and, and a trade has to occur if you're a traditional indexer. We don't have to worry about that. Secondly, patient trading. When a company in one of our uh, mutual funds from DFA or AQR, no longer fits the parameters of that particular mutual fund, DFA and AQR don't have to sell it right away. They can wait. Sometimes these companies go down in stock price and it's temporary and they come back up. 
They don't have to sell it where a traditional indexer does have to sell it and then buy it back again. Um, they don't have to make a change in the portfolio because what they're simply trying to do is deliver the returns of an asset class or deliver the returns that the factor exposure is, is giving us. And uh, that's a fancy way of saying when you own a mutual fund that owns hundreds and in some cases thousands of stocks per fund, uh, one stock is not going to make a, a huge difference in the short run. Uh, for the returns of that fund. And therefore, these firms do not have to react in a knee-jerk, rea- a knee-jerk manner. Thanks, Pat. Um, you know, I guess to just kind of wrap this up, because I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through at the moment. So, um, you know, if you have them or if something comes to you after this particular webinar ends, feel free to call or email us at any time. Uh, happy to have further discussions on this or any other topic. Um, really, the, the summation of, of this entire thing is um, the, the process has some uncertainty behind it. We should expect some uncertainty in the marketplace, but know that you are in a very diversified portfolio and the portfolio in which you are in was um, chosen for you through a process um, so you can feel comfortable that you are in a portfolio that fits not only your time horizon, but your risk tolerance. So um, hopefully this was helpful to you. Like I said, if there's any other questions after this, uh, please reach out to us. We're we're happy to chat with you at any time. Uh, And if you have ideas for other um, webinar topics, you can also make suggestions to us at the info at Appella uh, email address. So Thanks uh, to you both, Pat, Phil. I really appreciate your time today. And uh, we will talk to you all very soon. Thank you.